I was thinking about how to just tell it as it is. Let's just say it like it is, tell it like it is. Well, Kemet, Kemet, we protest Kemet, you know Kemet, right? Kemet literally, literally comes from Ethiopia, literally. Figuratively, well, we could deal with the figure, you know, the figure of speech. We could deal with the allegories, the ancient mythos, mythology. But first of all, in the basic, in the natural, in the, in the earthly types, you know, the first of the two truths, as we grow in grace and we rise in consciousness, that Kemet, Kemet literally comes from Ethiopia or the Tob, the Tob land, the Tob, Tawa means good land, from the Kui land, from the Kush land. Some refer to it as the Taneter, the Taneter, from the land of the ancient Elohim or the, the gods, yeah? But Kemet literally, right? Because this argument about the ancient Egyptians, quote unquote, you know, the ancient Mitzrayim, the ancient uh, Kemetiu, like were they this or were they that? But the fact is right before us, right? In, in living color, right? That, that reddish brown, dark, black crown, literally, right? In fact, comes from Kush, what's referred to as Kush, or the ancient Kemetiu. I think one of their references to land was the Kui, Kui land, the Kui land, the, the source of the headwaters, right? The headwaters of the Nile, the mountain, the moon land, or we have those ancient, you know, the, the ancient place that we have these modern countries, right? Like Ethiopia, Kenya, um, Tanzania, Wakanda, <laughs> Uganda, two ways of saying basically the same thing, right? Wakanda, Uganda, right? We have the, the source waters, as we have even in the Hebrew Bible, we see where water, right, even in the beginning is, is very, very important in water, even with the first mentions of this garden of delights, this Ganeta Aden, right, this Gan Ba'aden, right, the mountain of the moon, so the source, right, the source of the ancient Kemetic, the ancient, quote, Egyptian, Mitzrayim, the peoples. How important was the, the Kemet, <laughs> right, the Kemet, the Chem, t, the Chem, t, how important was the Kemet, the Kemetic, to the ancient Kemetics, to the ancient Mitzrayim, the ancient Chutapatapiyans, the Hetkapata Egypta, Egypta, where some say we get the Gibbets and the Egypt comes from that. Well, it was the source of their very lives, the source of their very lives. And where did it come from? It came from the same place that the ancient Kometiu, the Metunet, and even the Ryan Komet, you know, the sacred language and the language of the people points to the source, right, of those principles that some define as gods and goddesses, or the Netur and the Netert, or the Netur and the Netchert, you know, came from the Kui land, the Kush land. And then every year they looked forward to a, a re up. <laughs> it was a re up. Right, a re-up, ancient Mitzrayim needed that re-up, right, that came from, we could say, the, the source, right, of the Nile waters, the source of the Nile waters. Let's share this right here. This is just a couple of quick um, word picks right here on the Kemet, right, the Kemet coming from the Tob, coming from Tobia. Let's look at the ground. Let's get a good groundation. Right, a groundation. So you see this soil right here that we're showing right now. The Kemet is said to be black, the Kham, 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 black, right? And the the last letter, the T, right? The Tau, the Tav, that's used in ancient Kemet to you, is the land marker, right? Those who are familiar with the Metut uh, uh, Netter, right? Or the Metut, the Metu Netcher. Right, the sacred language and the Ryan Komet, the language of the people, will no doubt recognize this. And also one would recognize, well, where was its origin? And how the ancient Kometiu, they distinguish different kinds of ground. Right? We see about groundation, different kinds of ground. Right? And how it was very, very important. How 
that place, many of the ancient records say that Kemet was a colony, right? Or the civilization was founded by, for lack of a better word, ancient Ethiopians. I'd like to point to the ancient Ethiopians, because we have the modern Ethiopians. And there's a relation between the two peoples, but of course, or the peoples, right? This is the, this is the beauty, right, about the Tobe and Tobia, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, is that we have the ancient peoples, right? Definitely the Omotic and even the Oromo, right? Look at the Oromo linguistics, right? Even in the Amharic and in the Kala Ge'ez, hail up to, to Legesa Alen for his scholarly works, you know? Ones and ones really need to get into, you know, the Kala Ge'ez, he has gone through a lot of demonstrations and studies and research that shows us that the linguistic, the linguistic roots, according to the science of the language, the linguistic roots of the ancient Mitzrayim, the ancient Egyptian civilization, right, can be found. And we can discern even better as we study the Metutaneta, the ancient Egyptian, the sacred language, can be found in the Akala Ge'ez, in the Ge'ez, in the Tigrinya, but also in the Oromo, Oromifa, and also in the Omotic, especially in the Omotic. These are languages of the peoples, right, of, for lack of a better descriptor, we find in the Horn of Africa, right, that Horn of David, where we have the mountain, Right, the mountain of the moon and the source of the headwaters of the Nile. So here, this seems to be an Ethiopia picture right here where we have, um, um, not too sure, you know, at this a worker, right, one working. It seems like it could be a woman, right, a woman here working the land. Right? It could be a man, but a woman, a worker. That's what I said, worker, because, you know, we all got to work the land. You know, when we live in the land, you know, every part of the fam, right, has a role and responsibility on the land, right? They would say, if you don't work, right, you don't eat, right? He who don't walk, don't eat. So just looking at the ground right here, this is some Tobia, Ethiopia land right here. Now, notice that right here with Ethiopia, this is a part that is farmed, you know, see the equal roles of the Tillamoch, you know, the roles, Right, you know, the grid in that sense for sustainable agri culture. But look at the mountain in the background. What does that mountain remind you of? A mir, right? Uh, uh, a pi mir or a mir, right? Pi mir, pi mir, or just mir. The mir in the ancient Iran Komet language of the people and in the sacred language, the Metuta Net uh, or the Metu. And that uh, both of them are words in the in the script. Going to bring out out a little bit more, but it's a mountain. That mountain, a pyramid, a pyramidal mountain. You see the pyramidal mountains. So this now helps us to answer another question. Since the Nile Valley, the Nile Valley civilization was founded by the peoples, and I want to emphasize the peoples. Right? The native, you could say, and the ethnic peoples, right, of that horn of Africa, that inner Africa, that Tobia, Tob that Ethiopia region. So we both get the contribution, right, of the peoples, but also the contribution of the ground, the contribution of the land with the inundation. And the correspondence of the inundation of the Nile is with that Earth Day, that birthday of the man-child, Lij Tafari, but also that rise of what is referred to as the dog star, right? Sirius, yes, Sirius, Sirius, Cyrus, Sirius, Osiris, Sirius, Osar, Osiris, yes, the inundation. The rich, fertile soil left behind stop for a moment let's, let's stop for a moment stop for a moment right here just so, you know we, when we look at the word right word shape reality the rich fertile soil left behind <laughs> okay left behind after the Nile the Hape the beginning and the end of the Ethiopic alphabet right the Hape that reclining lion Right within the Metuneta, the hieroglyphic glyphs, 
after the Nile, the Hapez flood was called silt. All right, so this silt, where did the silt come from? Generally speaking, consistently speaking, year in and year out. Now, when it didn't happen in a year, then the people of the Nile Valley knew that famine and food shortages was on the way. When that inundation did not happen as expected as usual, all right, was called silt. It was also called Kemet. Right? It was also called Kemet, which means, some say dark land, right? but actually means black land. Because now the ones are wrestling. When some of the first, we could say, um, pro-black and consciousness scholars right, of that kind of reawakening resurrection in the late 80s and the early 90s, we were there. You know, they started to speak about Kemet and the Kem and the Kam and how it meant black and ancient Egypt, so forth and so on. And the Kemet was that black land, both the people being black people and the land being black. And now people try to say dark land. I, I just want to point that out. They say dark land. Now, this is going to make us now go and do some more um, hieroglyphic, you know, Metutinet uh, studies. To find out, is there a separate word? So some of y'all out there that are fellow scholars, is there a separate word in the ancient Kemetic for dark other than black? Because we know that in the sense that we receive this teaching, right, from, I have to say, the real pro-black, black consciousness scholars of the late 80s, early 90s, who really started this kind of consciousness thing that we have, you know, Others out there, you know, on a certain level, the Sarnettas, the, the kings and the queens, so to speak, of consciousness, right? That bring on many, you know, different guests to reason, present, and even sometimes debate, right? So we can grow in grace and that knowledge. So Kemet means a dark land. Kemet, we could say, means, let's call it the Ethiopian ground. <laughs> can we call it that, the Ethiopian ground? Because they're not connecting where does that dark land that that Kemet or that that silt right that rich fertile dark reddish brown and so deeply it's such a deep rich shade of red you know because you could have red that's like light red and then you have some red like you look at um look at horses you see some horses that are brown they're like reddish brown you know and some have a dark reddish brown you know kind of complexion that rich fertile soil left behind after the hape the niles flood the naha nahar in the hebrew nahar ha nahar the nal nal nahar right the flood was called silt but where did the silt come from now herodotus herodotus Gifts of the now, number one. The number one gifts of the... Let's pause for a moment. What did Herodotus mean by this? The gifts of the now? Well, we do have to give credit at least either to the one Herodotus, if he was a real person. We don't know if he's a real person. You know, something want to try to say that, you know, those who we point to, to be our ancestors, you know, um, natural, you know, and supernatural, right? You know, earthly and heavenly. They say, well, are they real? Did Yeshua exist? Well, did Herodotus exist? Did the Roman Empire exist? Did it even happen? You know, did Julius Caesar exist? Did he really live? Where's his bones? Have you seen his bones? So he just had this bone right here to pick. Not so much with Herodotus, but with how some of his works, on one hand, is suppressed because he speaks a lot about the Ethiopians, right? And this is where the original scholars of even the Egyptology, the European, European, American, you could say white scholars, you know, but it wasn't just them, but they were the ones who kind of get the first place in these times of the Gentiles. So the gift of the now, the number one gift was silt. That was black soil. Now you're talking black soil, <laughs> silt, because literally if you look at the soil silt, it, it looks black. If you look carefully, you might see that deep reddish, that dark reddish. You can see a little bit of dark reddish brown there, right? But basically, it was black soil silt was left by the floods. By whose, whose floods? The Ethiopian highland floods? See, why do they always try to suppress this and keep this out? You know, you know the, the real, just the floods, the, the flood, just where the flood come from. It's just floods. 
Right? One might think that it was Egypt's, Mitzrayim's floods. No, even they credit these floods with the Kui land, the Kush land, with the Ta Netcher, Ta Netcher, Ta Netcher, you know, the land of the gods, the Kui land, right? Or what we call today Ethiopia, or more better because of the present artificial borders on these artificial maps, you know, the Mountain of the Moon region. Or we can say that horn of Africa, the horn of Tobia, that good horn, the good horn region, including Ethiopia, modern Ethiopia, um, um, Kenya, Tanzania, you know, Wakanda, Uganda, and also other countries share right there, going all the way to the south, right, and heal up to South Africa, I and I, brothers and sisters, they are. Now, this allowed farmers to grow a surplus of crops. Mm. So that gifts of the now, we want to propose, we should call it the Ethiopian gifts. Let's call it the Ethiopian gifts. You know, they said that the first shall be last and the last shall be first, all right? So the last of all peoples now in this first world times are the first, and the first of all people are pushed to the back. So now we have to put the order, you know, what's it, balance the equation, good over evil. Ethiopian gifts, or Ethiopia gifts, <laughs> is gifting the now. Ethiopian gifts of the now, the number one gift was silt. The black soil, silt, that we know is the Kemet. So am I correct in stating that Kemet literally came from Ethiopia, from Tobia, from the Kui land, the Kush land, right? And it was left by the Ethiopian floods or the mountain of the moons, right, flood in the Ethiopia region, right? The silt, and we say Ethiopia, <coughs> Let us point this out. We're going back to the ancient Tob and Tobia. We're not going to what the Greeks heard when they heard us say Tobia. When the Greeks heard us say uh, Tobias, right, and Tobia and Tobia, they said Etiopis, Etiopa, Etiopis. That's what they heard there, and they basically, you know, translated that to be, um, you know, Burnt faces in some trance, that's, that's how you think it is, but actually it means burnt in a sense of shining faces, illuminating faces. It's because of the sun, the sun in that particular region of the world. You can see it in a lot of native people, you know, especially when they're not like, you know, kind of washed out by being in the West so much. You know, like over there, you can see the sun, the sun has kissed them, like the woman in Song of Solomon's when she talks about the sun. You know the sun connection in Song of Solomon, when she talks about how the sun has kissed her, right? Or in another Akisla Talena. Interesting, the word in Amharic is actually Akisla Talena. It actually means to like carbonize. You know how the sun has kind of carbonized. How the sun and the melanin, right, does something to those who are melanated like those particular peoples in that particular region and it causes them you know to have some extraordinary shades right of what we can call generally speaking the black complexion right or the black complexion the different shades you know from cafe au lait you know reddish brown right you know you say brown black blue black all of that all right, so the verse I wanted to point out right there, no, let me do this right here so one can see this on the screen. All right, just the screen share this right here so you can see the actual, um, what you said, what you said, look not upon me, all right? Look not, hold on for a moment, let's get back here. Look not upon me, all right? How does King James, we're gonna go to the King James translation right here, all right? Um, black and comely. It's, more correctly, it will be black and comely, right? But they add in but. That's what they do. They add in but, right? <laughs> she's saying, she's saying, some people think it's Solomon, 
but we learn when we start to read our linguistics, you know, that also is not brought out in translation, the masculine, the masculine and the feminine polarities of the linguistic. So when we look at it from that perspective, we know that the real scriptures was not what they call it, misogynistic or sexist, but the translators, they like to do a lot of it. You know, they say it a lot when it should be many cases ha and she. And sometimes they say he when it's actually speaking about it. But here in Song of Songs of Solomon 1 and 5, right, the maiden, the love interest, she says, I, black, I, shachor, shachor, in the Hebrew here, shachor, shachor, black. And then it says properly dusty, dusky, dusky, <laughs> dusky. You know, now folks are even trying, some folks, I guess it's the stages of grief. You know, the five, what are the five stages of grief for inferiority posing as white supremacy? <laughs> One of them is that bargaining. They try to bargain. Is it really black? It's really dusky. It's not really saying black. It's saying if a, if a white guy has a tan. No, it's saying black. That's why, look what it says also, but also absolutely jetty. You know, jetty like jet black, jetty, all right? So here is from the root shahar, shahar. Shahar is to be black. Notice what it says right here in the BDB, the Browns Drivers Briggs. The Kaal, the Kaal is a particular form, the base form of the word. Like when we look at the, you know, the science of the linguistics. To be black, open parenthesis of skin, close parenthesis. Uh-oh, my to be black of skin. The origin is a primitive root. They say it's identical with the H7836, which is shahar. So there's another word in Hebrew, right? Two, it's one word, but it has kind of the Hebrew two truths. We call this the Hebrew two truths, right? The two truths where words sometimes have like a kind of an interesting duality. You ever notice that? So the other side of this word sound is to seek to seek early, to seek earnestly, to look early or diligently for black, right? Black consciousness, shahor, that means you got to seek it, seek it early, seek it diligently, to look for diligently, seek, seek early. This is the verb right here, but Strong's bringing out in some of its um, translated usage where it's fairly accurate a primitive root here properly to dawn to dawn you ever heard the expression that the darkest part of the night is just before dawn have you ever experienced that ever out camping or out in you know in in nature as it, as ones will say and you know right before dawn we witnessed this on a couple occasions right before dawn it just seems to get real dark. You know, it's almost imperceptible. You might miss it, but you'll notice it if you pay attention. That's the price of truth. How much you got to pay for the truth? Pay attention, right? That it's the darkest part. And then all, all of a sudden, you start to see the light, you know? You know, that golden, reddish, you know, you know, golden light. The sky start turning red. From the black, right? From the black... That red comes up and we get the spectra, right? The spectra, you know, the light spectra. But this word here, shahar, in addition to meaning black, like black of skin, right? We also, um, Yamarish, we also have to dawn. That is figuratively. So the word to dawn, so even in this sense of the word shahar, it has a twofold, the Hebrew two truths. So it means to dawn. But in the figurative use of it, it means to be up early at any task. You know, like when you got something to do, you might get up early just before dawn so that you would hopefully be ready to do whatever work or get about whatever work as soon as the first light. You hear people say, at first light, at first light. In order to be up and on at first light, you got to be up early. That means you got to be up at the time that is the shahor, shahar, the, the dark part. Right? To be up early at any task with the implication. Now from this meaning, this base meaning, comes the spirit of the word earnestness. 
right? Somebody waking up all before dawn to be at some task, that's a very diligent and earnest person. By extension, by extension of the spirit of the meaning to search for the idea like painstakingly to search for. You know you want to rest a little bit more, but if you rest a little bit more, you're going to get up after dawn. You know you got to get up before dawn, right? To do something betimes. Well, the, after the colon and the, and, the, and, and the hyphen is how we can find this word in the King James Version. So in some areas of the King James Version, 1611, it says betimes. The word behind that is shahar, right? The word for early, right? You know, like the early hours, the dawn. And then also we have shahar, shahor, which means black, to inquire early, to rise betimes, to seek betimes, right? It almost betimes, it almost sounds like be for time in a sense of the dawn, right? Begins the first hour of the day, even Ethiopically has the Ethiopians still keep that time in their own calculation, like biblical time. If you want to know how biblical time work, then study Ethiopia time, right? The traditional, the ancient keeping of time, right? Be time. So before the first hour, the first hour of the day is what we would call like seven o'clock because what we call 12 o'clock right ethiopically speaking right according to the true the ancient biblical ethiopic um way of telling time 12 o'clock will be what we call six o'clock so seven o'clock right is 1 a.m and for more on the time telling please check out Amharic for Rastafari. You can look up in the in the video library, you know, for, for time and telling time. But some very great videos there. Give thanks, brothers and sisters. So to seek diligently or early in the morning, right? Early in the morning. So early in the morning, it really begins from the black time, right? And thus we have this compare and contrast. We have Shahor, Shahor coming from Shahar. Shahar to be black and there's an identical meaning that has the idea of duskiness or the blackness right the darkness you could say or the blackness of early dawn right so we have Shahar right there you see how that works right there so back to this we have Song of Songs 1 and 5 where the maiden the love interest how do we know this because studying the Hebrew and saying the King of Kings, Ali Selassie first, Bible, Revelation 5 5. Also, it verifies the, the better Hebrew right there as well. That there is a male and a female speaking to the majority of the dialogue. There's also uh, there's also like a group of men, the watchmen of the city, and there's also a group of the daughters of Jerusalem. Right? But the main conversation is between a a male and a female. You can't easily discern it in the English because the English language it is gender problematic. You know what I mean? And we're not we're not supporting any of these, you know, like um alternative kind of things in that sense. We're just speaking the truth. Maybe because people didn't understand it in its right, you know, its right context, we're getting a lot of you know, um, mental disorders or, or, or some things like that because some of these things are so clear when we read it from the biblical, scriptural and the related languages are you not as the children of the Ethiopians so the Ethiopic also bears witness but here we know it is it is she, right you know, it is she speaking right here, right she says, I am black but well, I am black and comely. In fact, let's just do this right here. I know this is on the Kemet, but we're talking about the Kemet and talking about the Kemet, we're talking about the black, right? So, Shechora, because of how it is pointed, Shechora, Shechora, right? That's like if a female is saying, like a man might say, Shachor, Shachor Ani. As a man, I'll say Shachor Ani. As a woman, she will say, Shachora Ani. And that's where it begins right here, Shachora Ani, with Nawa, with Nawa, with Nawa, right? Modern Hebrew they'll say Vinava, Vinava, Shahorani, Vinava. But the ancient Afro-Shemitic, Ethio-Shemitic, Shechora, 
shekhorani i we an nawa 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 what is nawa what is nawa nawa is comely right you can see there they have the v there and one transliteration but then the phonetics has a w then you try to put the w and the v but more ancient anciently it was a w right nawa what is nawa 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 she's nawa nawa wa wa right comely beautiful seemly comely beautiful right so we have nawa right here my point here and just zooming in on this is not i am black but even though i'm black you know i'm 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 kind of beautiful no she's saying i am black basically she's saying i'm black and beautiful wow so it wasn't the 60s or through the constitution of the ethiopian world federation right we the black peoples of the world one of the first organizations ethiopian world federation in 1937 think about people were still saying the negro negro thing you're not universal negro improvement but they already were ahead of their time it would take our black people especially in this north country right another 30 years to the time of the 50s but more over 60s and heal up to um kwame Touré aka stokely carmichael because we've seen the video we heard his testimony he was one of the ones that really brought that word sound you know to more how you said to the people right he announced it it was like, almost like a voice crying in this wilderness of north america but the point here is that that but there where it says but you see that one little word it implies that being black you know might not be comely might not be beautiful you know what I'm saying? That, that's what that implies. I am black, but comely. But she's saying, Shekhora ani. Wa nawa. We nawa. We nawa and beautiful. And she's speaking, right, to the daughters of Yerushalayim. Right, to the daughters of Jerusalem, who also, in today's, what you call them, will be melanated. Right? In a general sense, black. Even when we say black people, there's some black people who are lighter in complexion. Some might be reddish brown, reddish brown light, reddish brown dark. You know, they could be reddish brown light like um, uh, Malcolm X. Check out the video, you know, on Detroit Red that we posted on this channel. Rastafari Yehudi, Rastafari Jews. But she's speaking to the daughters of Jerusalem. And she's saying as a tent of Kedar, 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 Kedar. Right, they said son of Yishmael, right? Proper noun, people of Kedar. But let's go into this the Bedouin, the Bedouin, right? The Bedouin tribe. But notice what it says dusky. Strong's definition says dusky. Remember, we had dusky with Shahor. So here she's saying she's proud to be black, right? She, is, she knows she is black and she knows she is beautiful. She says, I am black, right? And beautiful. Not, I am black but beautiful or but comely. She says, I'm black and, and. We have a whole word if we want to say kind of like but in that sense in Hebrew, right? That's not the right sense. And perhaps it was so unavoidable, but it probably caused them a lot of consternation, right? To keep that in there. We give thanks for that honesty that they kept at least that testimony, you know, to the Ethio Hebrew peoples and the ancient peoples. We have Qadar. But look what Qadar means. Qadar means to be dark. You get this here? You get the um, analogy, one might say metaphor, right? The Hebraicism here. Remember when we showed you the, the, the slide on, on Kemet, on the Kemet, and it says dark. Then we show you the Herodotus slide, and it says black. And some try to use the dark to take away from the black, right? <laughs> But notice something, that here in Song of Songs, Shir HaShirim, as it's known, Mahale Mahali Zeselaman, in chapter 1, verse 5, she's saying, I am black and, and then she's now saying, oh, daughters of Jerusalem, she's talking to the daughters of Jerusalem, right? Because they were, you could say, black peoples, but they saw this queen here with her, you could say, beautiful black complexion more fuller you know some black people have more of a you know that black complexion that black and beautiful complexion while others may be beautiful and they don't have quite as black a complexion 
You know, we see this among different, you know, African, you know, ethnicities as well. And one time, right, this would be kind of celebrated that we come in, you know, we're not a monolith. We come in this, these range of tones. That might be why they tried to say, quote, colored. But we're not defending that. Adar here, the H6937 means to mourn, to be dark. So she's using this as a as a point of reference, right? She says, what well, says ashy, but they say that is dark colored, right? They say by implication, by implication, that means this is not exactly, it's dark colored. The Kedar is dark colored. As you'll find that the original Arabs, right? Or the ancient peoples that were the Arabs. And let me just qualify this, the pre-Ishmael Arabs, and even the Ishmael Arabs, right, in history, they were referred to, to be Ethiopian peoples. They were referred to be to be black peoples, right? And there is um, a lot of history that can be found, even if they suppress some of these documents. Others know what we are talking about, and we've seen some videos out there where they talk about Black Arabia, you know, bringing that out again so we can just know the truth for ourselves and be free of inferiority that poses as so-called supremacy or white supremacy whatever right in sackcloth or they say sorted garments but notice after the colon and the hyphen which represents in the strongest definition how the words are found up and down the king james version it says to be black to be blackish <laughs> Now, ish in Hebrew means a man, and isha means a woman, and could also in context mean a wife, isha, eshet, oset, wife. So to be a black person, to be a black man, or black ish, ish, right? To be, to make dark, to darken. But in the context, when we now take the word from the literal to the figurative, so the two truths, the literal directly, and to the figure. Of speech. I've been using this example for a while, but I use it here again. If someone said, if I say to someone, "Hold your horses," right? If I said, "Hold your horses," most folks know well what "hold your horses" mean. "Hold your horses" mean like wait up, wait up, wait up, right? But now we're used to that sort of metaphor, that sort of um, um, idiom. They call it like an idiom, right? Now in the Hebrew, we call this he. Hebraicism, these sort of idioms. So from that idea of to be dark or black in the context of the name Kedar can also symbolize to be like heavy, something's heavy on you. You know what I mean? Um, 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 can't see no sun, you know, misty morning. Yeah, misty morning. That sense of, you know what I mean? Can't see no sun. So the dark part of the night has gone, the shahar has come in, the dawning has come in, but they're so misty and can't see the sun. That sense there, and that can have a context of, you know, in the spirit of the word to mourn. So when I say, hold your horses, I don't mean literally, well, I don't have no horses. That means you don't understand the spirit of the word, right? You hear the letter, you get the letter of it, but not the spirit of it. So here... Getting back to or forward to um, the Queen of Sheba type. I call this the Queen of Sheba type. Now, we cannot say affirmatively that it is, but it does match the context, right, of our Ethiopian Hebrew royal order history, right? As the curtains of Shlomo, Solomon, right? And she says, don't look upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. So according to the context of the text, right, she must have been coming out of a place like Ethiopia. Check it out. 13 months of sunshine. 13? I thought there was only 12 months, right? Because it 12, how many months are there? 13 months of sunshine? She said, look not upon me because the sun hath looked upon me. The sun has looked upon me, right? And, and carbonized. Like we said in the Amharic in his Matthew's Bible, he uses Akislo Atalana, Akislo. And I had to look, you know, search out the etymology, Ethiopic etymology. It basically means to carbonize. And you know what color carbon is, right? Carbon. And carbon, get this, carbon is the foundation, right? The foundation 
of um, manifest life, you know, or the five cycle world. One of the foundations, I say one of the foundations of the manifest realm, the manifest world, this, this plane of reality is the carbon, right? The carbon. We have a carbon organic structure. Our bodies, I like to say Hebraically, the carbon, the carbon, the carbon. And I know what, six protons, six neutrons, six electrons, yeah. So, so recognize what the scripture is saying here, right? She's saying, don't look upon me, right? Look not upon me because I am black. Now, even this part here, to tell you the honest truth, and brothers and sisters, I don't want to tell you anything other than that. We just have to go into this, this verse right here just momentarily, just momentarily. Let's look at the Hebrew. Because that because, because, is there a because there, right? What does it say in the Hebrew there? Right, so here we're going to compare verses. Let's go down to Tanakh, right? Right. So here in the last, um, the last or the first, uh, was it? okay, yeah, first part of it. Al tiruni, al tiruni, al not tiruni, tiru tiru like you all, like not for you all. Right, she's saying not for you all. Right, right to look. Right, ni ani upon ani upon I al tiruni. I don't look upon I she ani for I for I shehar shehar choret shehar choret. Wow, 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 wow. This is an interesting form of it. It's not the shahar, but there's something called like um the gerun. It's like a reduplicating. My, you know, it's a sense of, it's not like the reflexive. Shechar choret. I am like blackness. I am, she, see what it says, shechar choret. Right, this is where, you remember the blackish? Blackish, right? There's a series now, blackish. Right, I am blackish. I'm swarthy. I am black and black and the black and the black. I am black. Like, let me give you an example here. I hope I downloaded it right here just to share this as a word pick because many ones have kind of used it as a point of reference before. I hope I got it right there. It's one of the ancient commit to you, um, not Nefertiti, um, Nefertari, Nefertari. I'm looking for Nefertari. I might not have Nefertari right here. Let me see if I have Nefertari, All right? It's interesting, cool. in ancient Egypt, she is beautiful and very, very black, All right? She's very rich and black that would be a sense of the um the shehar choret the shehar choret shehar choret right it's a reduplicating of it it's like when we say for real for real for real for really 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 for real for real you know when we repeat like that no i don't have it here in the ready in the ready graphics here chan I got to follow up on that. But here, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, this is just bringing out that sense. So she doesn't say, she doesn't say, um, Sha'ani, um, Sha'ani, that I am. Don't look upon me, that I am, Shahar Choret. Right? Don't look upon me like that. It's almost like, even if we are not, like many of us are not black as many of our ancestors and others on the continent. Some are very, we say blue-black. And you know how ones look on a blue-black, especially if they're used to ones who are not so blue-black. This is what she's saying here, right? So it's nothing about any put-down to her natural complexion, but she attributes this, right, to the sun, right, to being in a region of the world where she must be getting and must have gotten a lot of sunshine but her point here is not about that but she says my ch my mother's children were angry with me right so my mother's children were angry no she said my father's children my mother's children were angry with me they made me the keeper of the vineyards but my own vineyard have I not kept now, this here rings true of the Queen of the South that Yeshua HaMoshiach referenced, right? The Queen of Sheba. Makat Aliyah, Sitchin, Amchin. Yeah, 
um, hear me clicking, just wanted to get this lighter going, you know what I'm saying? But my own vineyard have I not kept. And I say to the brothers and sisters who are, um, I'm not saying shallow, you know, who are, who are like, we're reading a lot of different things about other scholars and other people telling us things about Ethiopia or Kemet, but we also have to kind of up our skills so we can tend to our own vineyard, you know, our own vineyard, not just keep their research and what they've said, but go into these studies, you know, for ourselves, right? So here, 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 brothers and sisters, this video here, Kemet, right? The Kemet literally, literally, right, comes from Ethiopia. The important usage of the now, right, the now that begins not in Egypt, but actually in inner Africa, in Etobia. We can retrace as we go to the south, but an important juncture, my right, contribution is the mountains of the moon, right? Secondarily was agriculture, right? In ancient Egypt, they had a time known as shait, like shait, shait, shait. That was the inundation, June, around June to like October. It's interesting because it is said that the ancient Egyptians had three seasons. I don't know if some of you who have studied you know, ancient uh, Egypta, Hekapita, the, the Het Kapita, the Hut Kapita, right? Know that ancient Mitraim, ancient Kemet, had three seasons the inundation, the Shait, right? A time of rising flood waters. Farmers had time to build. So they had time to build. You know, they would actually go to the higher ground. Then we had the emergence. Right, the emergence was November to February. Right, uh, Peruit, right, Peruit, or Peruit, 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 Peruit. Right, this is the return of the water to the river. Right, this is when the planted crops. Right, this is when water was trapped for irrigation. You know what I mean? For the times when they could not depend on the Hapet, on the Nahar or the Nile for those waters to come from the mountain of the moon, the horn of Ethiopia, the horn of Africa region. Then there was the drought time, right? The drought times was from March to June. That was known as Shemu, right? The Shemu. And this was like the harvest time, right? So there were these three seasons, right? And all of this is the gift, the Ethiopian gift, right, of the Nile, right? So by 3000 BCE, towns and cities emerge. This is what the scholars tell us, right? They built irrigation canals to increase farmland. Okay, so all this water, right? If we make use of this water, right, we'll be able to plant, to farm, to eat, you know? Just as Sumer, right? And we talked about this before that we see Ethiopia, the Tobia, the mountain of the moon lands, and those peoples as being the originators of both the now valley civilization but also the the sumer right the sumer river valley civilization as well egypt became the core civ in the mediterranean or oh, the core civilization this is true when we had the bronze age collapse right there was a bronze age collapse some say roughly around 1200 bc some say 1100 but within that range some go even up to 1300 bc uh, many civilizations just ceased and disappeared the one that survived it right was mitzrayim egypt survived it so in the bronze age civilization there was a mycenaeans uh my mycenaeans and other ones they just the hittites a lot of them just seem to have more or less for the most part disappeared at this particular time this was the first part of the presentation early civilization on the nile it's that early civilization so let's take what the ancient egyptians said they said that the gods the natures and the netchert and the goddesses or the male and the female principles as others would bring it out came from the mountains of the moon area the area that we can call the tobia ethiopia the kui the kushland right that's what he said the ancestors came from the romit the original the native um mitraim or ancient egyptians then we have the 
the, the, the key the key ingredient for civilization you know because there were different parts of ancient Egypt wasn't so dry as we see it today right there were dry areas and there were rich areas but there there needed to be civilization so in ancient times when this rich black soil that came from Ethiopia I gotta add that they don't add that here you see how they leave Ethiopia out the equation they know it's there so this bias is the bias of inferiority posing as superiority or white supremacy. Could they leave it out? They leave it out. In fact, I, there was a video I saw. I got to check it out. They said, Ethiopian, who are the most hated people by, in the world? And I think that the sister that was doing that video based on how it was presented, I didn't click on didn't watch it. I think she was talking about the Ethiopians. But it would make a lot of sense. You know what I mean? And it's like, what happens to black people? Are you not as the children of the Ethiopians or to me? Right? Or children of Israel. The second, right? So the rich black soil, it covered the banks in the delta. The delta is the lower part. Right? It's the lower part. Well, when we say the lower part, it's the part that's in the north. Let's put it like that in the present orientation of the map. Secondarily, there was annual floods. So every year there was floods, especially around July 23rd, what's called the Earth Day or the birthday of Haile Selassie I. We call it the, the Earth Day, the birthday of that man-child of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12. But around that time, September 23rd, when the dog star uh, Sirius right, rose up, right, there was this inundation, the annual floods. And this replenished the soil because when the people got, we could say, got organized, got together, whether it's at the time of Menes or Narma or Nimrod or what have you, you know what I'm saying, that they got together and they used that rich soil, you know, to plant their crops, to do different agricultural things for their survival, you know what I mean? And um, then new soil came forward, right, in the next inundation. So it, they say around 500 BCE, before what is known as the common era or from the Christianity perspective before the Christian era Egyptians Mitzrayim, the Kemetiu they learned agricultural skills from Mesopotamia now this is a legend that they learned from Mesopotamia my research has brought out that there is some truth to that but the Mesopotamians as they call them the Aram Naharaim folks they were also Ethiopian peoples or definitely Ethiopian related peoples. In fact, even the Bible tells you that Nimrod, right? The beginning of his kingdom was Babal, Akkad, you know, Kalna and all of that. That was over in that region. So he was a son of Cush, right? But Cush, we find this Cushite was way over there. You know what I'm saying? Because Ethiopia, in other words, ruled both sides. I say ruled influence let's put it like that because many of the ideas wasn't like the gentile ideas right at least it doesn't seem so initially you know what i mean be that as it may i want to show a map of this right here because there was a map that we saw and it was basically saying oh there we go texas now i don't know if this is fully accurate i'm still doing some accuracy checks on this you see it has a state of texas so it's saying that from what is presently our beachfront property known as the state of Israel, right, to like Elam and Susa, encompassing Babylon and a portion of the desert, it was as the size of modern day Texas. Now I don't know if whether you can conceptualize this in your mind, because Ethiopia is like out of the frame of this picture, but if you turn this, right, even towards the south, towards the Yemen region, right and towards the horn of africa you can see that from the ethiopia region as we know it today right to the region that we call um mesopotamia right between the two rivers right as mentioned in the bible along with ethiopia right in the first book of moshe or kush right in bereshith you can see that to travel from from say Babylon or from that region to where the present state of Israel is it's like from one end of Texas to the next end of Texas and if we turn Texas in an other direction right towards the south we can clearly see that roughly the same distance so if anybody went from one end of Texas to the next 
for example, you can see Ethiopia, you can see the south right here. And remember the size of Texas here in this demonstration? This is the northern part. This is this part right here, the part that's a little bit out of view, but the lower part is. So if we look at that, we can see that it's a little more than traveling from one end of Texas to the next end of Texas. So that means surely ones and ones journeyed, you know, from here to there. This is a little better kind of analogy. This here, some seek to say, well, this is how the rivers might have joined up in ancient times, even during the time when there was the... Um, what they call it, um, um, uh, plan, what's it called, pan Pangea, Pangea, when all the continental land masses were connected. Because what they find is that there are some rivers that are overt, and then there are some rivers that are covert, that through um, lower atmosphere so-called satellites, ground-penetrating radar, they can see where it seems to be dried up tributaries, right, that if we connect the present river, as we have with inner Africa, right, with Ethiopia and Kenya and Uganda and Congo and Tanzania, these countries that are there going to the south, that what the biblical um, testimony is saying was quite true, at least according to the knowledge that Moshe, right, he was learned in all the wisdoms of the Kemets, Right, of the Egypts, Upper and Lower Egypt, spent time in Tobia, Ethiopia, knew the, the desert regions, he knew the city, he knew both town and country. Right? So he was kind of fully, had a good, well-rounded education in the schools he went through. So no doubt, much of what we have in the scriptures come from that testimony. So Ethiopia, we have Cush there, right? we have Cush down there, but then we have Nimrod, Right in this region where the Tigris Euphrates River, where the arrows are pointing. Hmm. Isn't that very interesting? So that means that the Kushite, right, the Ethiopian, or for today's nation state talk, right, black, <laughs> ancient black people, right, were influential there. So don't dismiss the possibility, brothers and sisters, as we just showed in that last presentation. Because a lot would argue, oh no, ancient Egypt, but we're talking about based on the evidence that we can find, right? Based on the evidence that we can find, we can see that there was a connection between the Kushites, right, of Mesopotamia and the Kushites of the now River Valley civilization. And this is where we get the whole themes of farming. Notice that even in the Pur Im Haru, that one of the main things was that after one passed to the next life that they would be in like an ideal garden a farming situation how interesting is that harvesting the harvest generally took place shortly before the beginning of the next flooding about in may or june now notice what it says right here at times in april and this now connects with the Hebraic, the Abib, the barley harvest, also the Amharic. We have Abebe, right? Abebe, like to bud, and Abeba, flower. And in the Hebrew, Abib, that's the first month, first moon, that connects with Passover. Abib is the barley because it grows fast and it's the first in those regions of the crops. The whole population took part. And on big estates, journeying harvest teams were employed. We can learn something in our intentional communities and kibbutzim, chabarim. These um, itinerant reapers began the season in the southern part of the country. Notice that we're in the southern part that is basically close to the Ethiopia right, in Africa, Mountain of the Moon area, and follow the ripening crops. Notice that. They follow the ripening crops down river, right, the harvesting, right, and this also gives a demonstration, right, some of the pictures, but hopefully in the future we'll get into some of the, the writing, right, getting into the writing and getting into the reading and getting to the understanding for ourselves. Right, because we noticed that some of the Gentile European white scholars, some of them, I guess they did their best, but some seem to have, you know, um, another modus operandi, 
which we might have to call by the English expression malice of forethought, they sought to pervert the course of justice and try to deny right the black African Ethiopian connection. Right? So the fertile Nile Valley was fertile because the Kemet came from Ethiopia. Literally. Literally. There's more on this. Hopefully we'll pick up on this. This is just an introductory right into this theme, Chabarim. The black land was the land that had fertile soil good. Good. <laughs> right? Good for farming. Good in the Hebrew is Tob. Right? One of the ancient names of that region we call Ethiopia was Tobia. Right? Etoba. Etoba. The good land. Tobia. Right? So the soil was black. Right? And that black, that Kemet, came from Ethiopia, Tobia. The black land was the land that had fertile soil. Good for farming. There was a red land, and this is how they refer to the desert. So you see the contrast over there. The desert land surrounding the river now, protecting it, protecting her from invaders. Egypt, Mitzrayim, Het Kapita, Kemet, did not have to worry about invaders and enjoyed nearly 2,000 years, two millennia of peace, relatively speaking. Right, another contrast here between the black land, you can see a little bit of reddish tone right there, and the desert land down here, right? The red land that was known as the red land, right? So, here, 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 brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, the Kemet from Tobia, from Ethiopia, more to come, y'all willing. Kemet was a black, was an Ethiopian civilization. It is not the heritage of the Arab Egyptians any more than the Mayan civilization is the heritage of the Spaniard. Shalom, Chabarim. Shalom. Hotep. <laughs>